stirring the coffee with chopsticks. Using the vortex method, the only true way to optimize the taste of your coffee at the molecular level. It's another good morning. Welcome to the Daybreak Show. I am the Sultan. We'll get started, but first, coffee. Ah, perfect. That blend is perfect. You know when you get a certain blend of spices or coffees or teas or a certain recipe where you didn't write down the proportions? The next time you do it, you kind of have your fingers crossed, hoping that you're going to get the proportions right because this is perfect. I threw together what was left of the Ethiopian beans, the Guatemalan beans, and then the Mexican chiapas. And I don't really remember the proportions. It was what was left in the bottom of each bag. So I came up with this. So this might be the only time that I actually enjoy this. So when this is done, I might end up going back to dirt again. You never know. Let's get started. Where you've been lately, there's a new kid in town. Everybody loves him, don't they? Now he's holding her, and you're still around. The Eagles, 1976. Alexa, light the fireplace, play Marvin Gaye, and pour me and my wife a glass of wine. George, you don't have a wife. Alexa, you're getting smarter every day. Thank you. Actual conversation with Alexa. You know, I don't even know what I'm hoping to find. Jackson Brown, 1977. What is your favorite motorcycle accessory? The kind with a big smile and arms wrapped around my waist. And of course there was someone, and I say that tongue-in-cheek, jokingly, because there's nothing like riding the cycle and you've got a woman on the back with her arms around your waist and you're having a great afternoon. You stop, you have lunch, go to a cafe, grab a bite to eat, tooling through the mountains, around a lake, in the countryside. That is such a great afternoon. Perfect. I don't like the highway driving. I like the highway driving by myself. But as far as just tooling around the countryside or mountains, I love that. Love that. Someone said, my favorite accessory is me on the motorcycle. I'm like, all right. Whatever, dude. Whatever. I believe that what we become depends on what our fathers teach us at odd moments when they aren't trying to teach us. We are formed by little scraps of wisdom. Umberto Eco. Born in 1932, died in 2016. Hey, if you didn't see my video yesterday, on New Year's Day I took a walk in Fairmount Park in Philadelphia. It's a place, it's one of the places where I walk on a fairly regular basis because the metric is pretty clear. They have mile markers. I know when I walk to the covered bridge and back to where I park, I know it's a certain amount. I know when I walk to Valley Green and back, it's a certain amount certain distance. I like that. I used to walk Valley Forge Park when I lived in Chesterbrook. And the Valley Forge National Park loop was 5.5 miles. And that was perfect. When I lived in Bucks County, I used to walk uh, Peace Valley Park, Lake Galena. And that was 6.2 miles, that loop around the lake. So perfect. But I did this walk I took away the audio, and then what I did was I pieced together clips, and it's in 
in yesterday's latest video. And I read a poem by Rudyard Kipling called If. I'll put a link for it down below. I just love that, love that poem. That was written in 1895 and not published until 1910, 15 years later. So maybe he wrote it for his son when his son was born and then published it when his son was a young man. I don't know. I don't know the story behind it. If you know the story behind that, please email me, gb at georgebruno.com. I would love to know the story behind the poem, If, by Rudyard Kipling, if you know that. The phrase, ide fix, spelled I D E E. Ide, and then fix. It's F I X E, but pronounced fix. Ide fix is an idea or a desire that dominates the mind, an obsession, a fixation, a consuming passion, a mania, a compulsion, a preoccupation, enthusiasm, infatuation, addiction, fetish craze, a complex, a bee in one's bonnet. That's an old school phrase, right? Man, they got a bee in their bonnet. A hang up or a bug. There was a while, probably in the maybe 2008, 2009, first time I ever went to Gettysburg, spent three days there at the battlefield and walking around town, just enjoying a nice long weekend there. And I got bit by the Civil War bug and couldn't get enough, could not get enough information about the Civil War and just read and watched every movie possible about the Civil War and the truth about the Civil War. And this is what I know to be true. Everything that you know about the American Civil War is wrong. Everything. Every single thing. That's all I'm going to say. When you dig deep into things, you find the truth. And what is usually presented to us as truth in schools growing up is the most palatable form of truth. And I wouldn't even call it a truth. I would just call it a press release, a spin. When you dig deep into everything, for instance, I was talking about Christmas. I'm not one of these people, like some people, I'm not, we don't get a Christmas tree in my house. We don't celebrate the pagan holiday. Shut the fuck up, please, seriously. Let's get real. Christmas is pretty much a Western it's a Western cultural holiday that is kind of related, or we are linking it to the birth of Christ. But Santa Claus, Christmas trees, all that kind of stuff, it's cultural. I get it, and I go along with it. It's the same thing as Halloween, when people say that's the time when all the pagans celebrate and blah, blah, blah. What It's like... To me, it's a cult American cultural, it's not even a holiday, it's American cultural practice. It's fun, Halloween parties, etc., etc. I don't, I don't view those things as real commemorations of events, of how those things originally happened. And I'm not a party pooper or a stick in the mud about holidays, it's like the major holidays. I'm, and usually people that are, are just real stiffs. Honestly, real stiffs. I go along with it, and I'm not a sheep. I'm quite woke. But I'm also an American. And I enjoy my culture here very much. I don't enjoy the bullshit, 
but I do have a very, very strong BS filter in my life when it comes to people, news. Some of my favorite students to teach are Paul Mitchell Beauty Academy students. At those schools, they're called future professionals. They're not called students. When I teach there, they don't take their eyes off of you and they're taking notes the whole time. Seriously, at the Paul Mitchell Academies, and I'm not kissing up to Paul Mitchell Academies or John Paul DeJoria, although if he has watched this show, he actually is one of my idols. You know what? I need to put a link to, to one of his speeches. He gave a speech, John Paul DeJoria, the dude with the hair pulled back in a ponytail, beard, one of the founders of Paul Mitchell Systems. Great, great bunch of products. He did a speech at Stanford University uh, Business School, which is the absolute best business speech I've ever heard in my life. If I remember, I'm going to put a link for it down below. It will blow you away. The guy's a multi-billionaire, but he, he was living in his car and creating this, this If you've seen Paul Mitchell products, it's a white bottle with black lettering. Is there a method to his madness? No, there wasn't. You know why it was a white bottle with black lettering? Because that was the cheapest. That's all he could afford. Guess what? That is now, when you walk down a beauty aisle with shampoos and conditioners and that kind of stuff in any stores and salons, you can automatically spot the Paul Mitchell products because it's a white bottle with black lettering. Just like when you're in a food store and you go down a soup aisle, like a canned food aisle, you know where the Campbell's soups are because it's the red and white cans. His branding started out literally as a mistake and it was the only thing that he could afford and he he sold nothing nothing without dealing with cash you did he didn't bill anybody it, they paid cash when he sold his shampoos and conditioners to salons it was a cash business and that's the beautiful thing about Paul Mitchell Systems it's a cash business I heard the same thing about Trader Joe's, that they're 100% solvent. It's interesting, right? But John Paul DeJoria, probably in one of my most, uh, I'd say he's in my top 10 of most inspiring people, not just business people, but people that I've known in my lifetime. I think you will love the speech. I'll put a couple links to his, I'll put a link to his life and lifestyle and also uh, a link to the Stanford University business speech. Phenomenal. As a matter of fact, I'm probably going to listen to it on the way to work today. So good. So, so good. I have three days. I work three days a week at a salon. Three packed days starting this morning. A couple hours from now. Thursday is usually my late day. I still work a real job, so to speak, even though I am a full-time content creator and writer and speaker. So I work, I do this full-time and everything related to this, and then three days at the salon. I always want my hands in people's hair. I want to be the guy that never loses touch with going somewhere, although some people say they like the free digital nomad lifestyle. I like that, but I have found that even as a digital nomad where I can live anywhere I want in the world, do whatever I, I can drive, whatever I want, live wherever I want, have the lifestyle that I want. But here's the thing. How different is it from working in a corporate world in a cubicle? I mean, it was hitting me, I guess, in the fall this past year that I'm just, a, I feel like I'm in a cube farm. If I'm just sitting at a, a desk or a table or in a studio, 
and doing my thing, how free am I? I still need to be able to work out. I still need to be able to interview people. I still need to be able to get out there. And I find that for me, going to a job, working with a team of people keeps me grounded because that's who I'm relating to. I'm speaking to you. You probably go to a job and work with people. This whole, what I would call like Lamborghini lifestyle, be free from everything. Half of that stuff is in people's heads. I will always be cutting hair. Always. It's something I love. Why leave something that you love? I love doing this. But why leave something that you love? I don't want to do it 60 hours a week. That's why I only work three days a week at the salon. And then cut families' hair in kitchens, basements, and porches. <laughs> All right. The best writers are readers. The best speakers are writers. The holy trinity of media or online success, if you're not a technical person, if you are a, a character, if you are a public persona, the holy trinity of success is reading, writing, and speaking. Writing backed up by reading and speaking backed up by writing. If that confuses you, just rewind it and listen to what I said. The best writers also read a lot. There has to be a lot of input coming into one end of the tube so interesting things can come out of the other end. Not only thoughts, but your words as well. And the best speakers are also writers. I put out the article, and you saw this yesterday. I said, oh shit, wait till I can make sandwiches. And the article was, sex dolls are way better than real women. They don't care what I do to them. Creepy ass shit. Someone said, well, it's no different than a woman using a dildo. Yeah, but there's not a 5 foot 10 muscular form attached to the dildo. It's just a pleasure device. The difference between a sex bot, a sex doll, and a woman's device is that this, like women are not Netflix and chilling with their dildo. These dudes are actually coming home from work, kissing it, hugging it, they sleep with it, they bathe it, they set it up at the kitchen table, they watch TV with it. Come on, dudes. And then there's the people, you know, there's the, what I would call the sexual libertarians. And I agree with this part here. I don't care if, one guy said, I don't care if he dips his thing in a bowl of hot noodles. I don't care either. Just stay fuck away from my kids and me. Creepy ass. Seriously. You ready for some blog? We're going to do some news as well. Something interesting.
Jeff Bezos' divorce. The cheating photos that ended his marriage. Okay. The $140 billion divorce, the most expensive divorce in history. So they're saying that she's going to get literally 60 to 70 billion dollars, literally half. This man forfeited half of his fortune. Jeff Bezos' divorce poison knock him from the richest to the fourth richest person on the planet. And his wife, just by leaving him, is going to be in the top 10 richest people on the planet. Just by leaving him. Now, did she work for any of that? I don't know. I'm not. I have no idea about Mackenzie Bezos, wife of 25 years. 25 years is no joke. Their split could have a drastic impact on the fortune of Bezos, who's currently ranked the richest person in the world with a net worth of $137 billion, according to Forbes. There's no word on whether the couple has a prenup, but they live in Washington, which is one of just nine community property states, meaning that most property acquired during the marriage in these areas is considered owned by both spouses and would be divided nearly evenly in a divorce. That could translate to the Amazon chairman falling to the fourth richest person in the world, assuming his fortune is halved from $137 billion to $68 billion. Currently trailing behind Bezos is Microsoft founder Bill Gates, with 94 billion business magnate Warren Buffett with 80 billion French business mogul Bernard Arnault with 70 billion and Mexican business tycoon Carlos Slim Hilu with 62 billion unless the Bezos have a prenup or postnuptial agreement which controlled their property division Washington's community property law will be in effect said Boaz Weintraub, a Seattle-based family law attorney. And I understand that Amazon was started after the couple got married, so it will be presumed to be a community property, entitling his wife to at least a 50% interest under Washington community property law. With regard to the effect on his net worth, unless there is a prenup or postnup in place, I don't see how his net worth is not significantly impacted by a divorce just based solely upon Washington community property law. Here you have a 25-year marriage, so that's pretty significant as far as the court wanting to make sure that both parties come out in a fairly similar financial circumstance, that they both have assets and support after the divorce. They'll either negotiate it or they will leave it up to the court to determine that what that could look like, Robertson said. The court's not going to want to do anything that would harm a business that is the main income flow. They may choose to keep it out of the courtroom and address all of these property issues through arbitration. <laughs> There's a lot to be said about that. A lot. And it's going to be interesting to watch. So we'll Stay in touch with that. Let's read some fake news. Millionaire's bizarre offer to newsreaders. Find me a wife and I'll pay you $50,000. Find this guy a pretty blonde with shapely legs, and he'll make you rich. Now, $50,000 I wouldn't call rich. Millionaire bachelor Clayton Salzman is hunting for a wife, and he's willing to pay a whopping $50,000 for the right gal. That's right, the 43-year-old Wichita, Kansas stockbroker says he'll write out a check for that amount to anyone who finds him a bride who meets all his demanding criteria. I know what I want, and I don't mind paying a small fortune to get it. Salzman, a good-looking guy who appears much younger than his years, it will be worth it to wind up with the woman of my dreams. 
I've been looking for a wife on my own, and I haven't been able to find one. I've concluded that I need help, but I'm willing to pay for it. Salzman says he decided to contact his favorite newspaper, the Weekly World News, to make his mind-boggling offer. He wants newsreaders to track down a wife for him with the following characteristics. She must be a pretty blonde between 5'5 and 5'8, curvy with long shapely legs. She should be between the ages of 23 and 35. She should be a high school or college graduate interested in and able to discuss a broad range of topics including mathematics, physics, ancient Greek, Roman mythology, modern art, astronomy, and gene splicing. She should be artistic, preferably a dancer or a painter. She should enjoy a variety of sports activities including, but not limited to, jogging, rollerblading, scuba diving, hiking, camping, biking, and mountain climbing. She should be a sweet-tempered woman who desires to dedicate her life to her husband and children. Remember, he's 43. Some say that I'm demanding, and I guess I am. But once I find my dream gal, I intend to spend the rest of my life with her, so she has to be perfect for me. Besides, I'm a well-to-do man who can give my wife a luxurious home, plenty of money for travel, clothes, the best restaurants, clubs, and constant adoring companionship. I'm offering some gal a lot. I think I deserve a lot in return. Salzman describes himself as an energetic, ambitious man who likes fast cars, fast-paced living. He's a world traveler, an athlete, gourmet cook, financial genius, and sportsman. Sounds like Patrick Bateman, an American psycho. Newsreaders who think they meet Salzman's list of stringent requirements, or know a woman who does, should write to The Bachelor. Salzman promises that on his wedding day he will pay the $50,000 reward to the person who helped him find his bride. If you referred yourself, he'll give you $50,000 on your wedding day to spend any day you want. Find me a wife and I'll pay you $50,000. Well, that's it for the fake news of the day. Let's talk about some real news. The real news would be this, that you're stuck. The real news is that you friggin' hate your life. The real news is that you want to do better. The real news is, is that you're clipping coupons and buying dented cans and shopping in thrift stores. That's the real news. And you're surrounding yourself with people who keep you there. You're in a relationship that keeps you there. Driving a car where you don't even know if it's going to start when you turn the key. It's time to change that. All of that stuff describes the life of a man or a woman who is stuck. It's time to get unstuck. 2019 is the year you get unstuck. What is the one thing that's going to change your life around? There's going to be a, an event, a video, something that I say that's going to strike you and you're going to say, holy crap, you just described me. I need to do something about this. I need to get unstuck. I'm not speaking to all the top performers. I'm speaking to the army of average. I've said this for years now. When the army of average has a fire lit under them, they become unstoppable. Relentless. Ruthlessly honest with themselves. Consistent, like the way the waves don't stop when you stop looking at them. Did you ever look at like cliffs, like on the ocean, and how the water has cut through them and beaten them and shaped the stones, the rocks, the cliffs. It's consistent. Just chipping away at the rock over years and years. Chip away at your dreams. Be consistent. Be like the water. Some people like that phrase, be like water. 2019 is the year that you get unstuck. 2020 can be the year that you make your first million. It can happen. One of the first things that you need to do is work on your body because that will spill over, bleed over to other areas of your life. The discipline that you have with your body is a great place to start. A great place to start. 
if you're already in shape and feel good about what you see when you look in the mirror and that you've got that down, then maybe an area where you're stuck is finances and saving or relationships or where you live. What is holding you back? Is it the people that are around you? Most people don't hang out with five people. They say that you're the average of the five people that you hang out with or associate with. What if you don't hang out with five people? Let me ask you this. Who are the f top five content creators that you watch or listen to or podcasters? Put your comment down below, please. You will be the average of the five people. Like if you're just watching, I got nothing against Ed Bassmaster. He's funny. Nothing against pranksters. But if that's all you watch, then there's, there's the reason why you're not where you want to be. I enjoy a good comedy. I enjoy funny things. But it doesn't define my life. Are there five podcasts, five content creators on YouTube that you must watch on a regular basis? Watching... Those five positive, progressive, moving in the right direction, motivating, informational, fire lighting, you will move in the direction of your five most favorite content creators. Who are they? List them down below. Who do you watch or listen to on a regular basis? And with that, I'm going to say finish your coffee. I've got to get ready for work because I have a job that I go to that I love. Actually, I have two jobs. I do this and I work at a salon. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thanks for joining me today.